Okay, so um, welcome everybody to the afternoon session. The plan now is to, to, is to have two panels, and I'll, um, I'll let the moderators explain more um, about what they will each talk about. But we have Freda Rosen just over there, and Ben Drew on the far end of that, um, that table there. And then we have the first panel up here on the stage of uh, learned individuals, and then the second panel just just there on the on the table. I will ask you to do some small amount of musical chairs after the hour and just swap positions, but the whole idea is that most of the engagement will be with the guys on top, but anyone within that area is is more than welcome to intervene if they feel they can you know contribute to to a question um, so that's basically it and um, I'd like to hand over to Freda Rosen to begin. Yep, you hear me? Okay, good, 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 good. Well, good afternoon again. Um, and I just want to begin by acknowledging what an honor it is to be here today and to be able to moderate a panel um, with uh, employers who have such an incredible commitment to expanding employment opportunities for people with Down syndrome. Uh, so let's start with some introductions. I'm Freda Rosen. I'm based here in New York City, and I'm the executive director of Job Path. And then we'll start right down here with Margaret Mullane. And Margaret is with Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, her um, colleague, Scott Borchardt, was scheduled to be here, but had a little train, plane trouble, I understand. Um, uh, next, uh, Peter Seville. Do I have that right? OK, good. Um, with Alex Partners from the UK. Is Andy Constable here with you, too? Oh, hi, Andy. Also from uh, Alex Partners. Uh, Bruce Barquet, yes, from Barquet, Epstein, and Kieran uh, here in the U.S. <coughs> Heather Lavalle, and Heather was here this morning as well. She's with Voya Financial. James Trout, uh, who was uh, who's with the Environmental Agency from the U.K. You were here this morning too, James. Yes. Okay. Good. I just wanted to be. I thought so. Just wanted to be sure. And uh, next down there is Andy, and that's it? We have John? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Jonathan Tabaski, <laughs> piping in here from uh, Mannion Gainer and Manning in here in the US. Welcome, everybody. Um, so there were a few uh, more in-depth introductions this morning, and uh, those who didn't get an opportunity to do that, we're gonna, each of us is going to take a minute or so to talk to you more about uh, our organizations. And we have some PowerPoints queued up, I believe. Yes? I go first. Okay, so uh, again, my name is Freda Rosen. I'm from an organization here in New York City called Job Path. Uh, how do I advance? Yeah, is there a clicker? Okay, <laughs> thanks. All these technical issues here. Okay, so, um, okay, great. So just a few quick words about Job Path. We were established in 1978 with a question. We started a pilot project to see if it was possible that people with Down syndrome, intellectual, and other developmental disabilities could move into employment in the mainstream workforce. And as you see on my PowerPoint, we say yes. That is how, and over the years we've seen several thousand, at least, people move into jobs. Um, so today, our work has gone beyond employment. We help people find jobs, live in their own homes, and become contributing members of their communities. Ah. Anyhow. But employment is still very much at the heart of what we do. And I'd just like to say that we believe in employment for all. I think that's a very important stance to take, that everyone, everyone has skills and talents they can contribute to the workforce. Uh, next up, Margot, I think, is you. Do I have to go back? <laughs> 
Oh, yes. <laughs> Said, my name is Margaret Lorraine, and I'm a senior associate. Oh, thank you. I knew I'd forget something when I was up here. Um, so, as Fred has said, my name is Margot Mullane, and I'm a senior associate with PwC's tax practice. Um, I'm in front of you today because I'm a co lead for our disability inclusion group uh, at the Boston office. My passion around inclusion and advocacy comes from growing up with a sister who has Down syndrome. Through my life experiences, I recognize the critical role that employment plays in the lives of individuals with Down syndrome and su fully support the objectives of today's conference. At PwC, we have always been and continue to be a place where anyone with talent and ability can succeed in the workplace as well as in the community. The network I lead in Boston promotes inclusion and offers support to employees with disabilities as well as caregivers of those with disabilities. We focus on empowering our members to integrate work and life while fostering a culture of inclusion and awareness and leadership, both internally and externally. Oh. The clicker strikes again. We'll see if my next slide comes up. Um, our network collaborates with the Massachusetts Down Syndrome Congress in this, their support of the Your Next Star campaign, which we heard a little bit about this morning. Um, my, one of my slides is missing, I guess. Um, so, sorry. Uh, the Your Next Star campaign is a web-based disability employment portal designed to raise awareness with the, about the benefits of hiring people with Down syndrome. Our collaboration focuses on the delivery of modules developed as part of our Access Your access your potential commitment, which is a corporate responsibility initiative at PwC. The modules help self-advocates build job seeking and financial literacy skills and promote community inclusion. We've also worked with the Mass Down Syndrome Congress to promote um, and host a forum which brought individuals and employers and potential employers together to share best practices in the employment of individuals with disabilities. Our delivery of modules seeks to build skills through self-advocate pr participation. We facilitate activities where our professionals help self-advocates practice their personal qualities and skills in resumes and interviews. We discuss approaches to networking and use activities to develop these skills. Finally, we facilitate conversations about the importance of work and the relationship of earning money and spending and saving. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate and address the conference today. Test. How's that? Right. Great. Oh, terrific. Thanks, John. And, and thanks uh, to Andrew for, um, for hosting and for Fred for handling this panel. And a special thanks to Maureen Gallagher, to the Mass Down Syndrome Congress, for extending me the invitation. My name is Jonathan Sadowski. I'm an attorney at a law firm uh, known as Mannion Gainer and Manning here in Boston. Um, and in uh, I, the way I got involved in the community was I have a daughter with Down syndrome who's about to turn 10. In 2015, uh, I was invited to a launch party hosted by the Boston Bruins um, for the Your Next Star campaign. And uh, I left feeling inspired 
Um, I, I really did. I had a great feeling that what they were doing was opening up all these opportunities uh, for, for people with different intellectual abilities um, to get meaningful work. Um, and I don't know if you can see, see the slides, but um, if you advance to the next slide, um, I, I found a quote that sort of talked about that a little bit, and, and I, thought it, I thought it melded well with what we're doing. So fast forward a couple of years, um, uh, and it actually can go forward a couple of slides uh, to the Your Next Star at a law firm. I, I had struggled um, personally to figure out how could we bring this into the firm? What roles could somebody with Down syndrome or some other intellectual challenge um, uh, play? And um, I, I had several meetings with our, with, with our really wonderful HR people uh, and with the managing partners at the firm and um, brought in um, representatives from the Massachusetts Down Syndrome Congress, Congress and the Your Next Star campaign to, to talk it out. And um, they brought to us several really wonderful candidates, one of which we wound up hiring. Um, and, 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 and she's really just been, uh, just, just been, an, it's been an amazing experience. If you continue to the our, our star uh, slide, it's a woman named Katie DeVillis, She's 22 years old. Um, she had come to us already with significant employment experience. She, uh, she worked at a hospital. Um, uh, she, uh, she worked at various camps. She, she, had, she had great experience. She went to community college. Um, really um, um, uh, an accomplished young woman. And we all fell in love with her immediately. And we, and we wanted to find a way to get Katie to come to us. One of the benefits of the Your Next Star campaign was that they gave uh, Katie, uh, a job coach at no cost to the firm, that, which allowed her um, uh, to, to sort of get integrated um, into our team. And um, some of the things that she, she does, if you go to the, to, to the next page, I mean, Katie, it, it's not really captured on the slide what Katie does for the firm. I mean, yes, she has, she has jobs that she has to do, whether it's, you know, stocking paper, or delivering the mail, or, or making sure that the offices are clean. And she does all of those things. But what she really does is um, act as sort of a unifier for our team. She's almost like the mayor. You know, she knows everybody, uh, way more people than I do, that's for sure, at the firm. And, and, um, and, and, she, um, and she really uh, serves to brighten everybody's day. It's really been an, an amazing experience. Um, and it's been such a success that we're actually – looking to expand it into our other offices. So we've started in Boston as our pilot program, and we have, we have four offices in California. We're in, we're in Louisiana, we're in Florida, we're in Delaware. And the goal is to have more people like Katie come into our program uh, and, and to really sort of complete our team. Um, just some examples, if you go to, we've got a couple of slides of a couple of pictures of Katie interacting with, 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 our, with our team, whether it's at the holiday party or um, uh, helping to coordinate some of the charity work that we do, um, I, like Toys for Tots programs and things like that. Um, uh, she's, been, she's, been, she's been critical in those roles. And then, and then finally, I, I, I'd say, you know, her relationships have, have extended well beyond the office. If you look at the second to last slide, there's a picture of many members of our team that actually went to go see Katie's, Katie perform with a choir group, uh, choral group in, in, um, in her, uh, in one, of, one, of, one of the many things that she does. So, so I can't speak more highly about the Your Next Star uh, program uh, in the Massachusetts Down Syndrome uh, Congress. Um, one thing I'd add, just uh, for people who are interested in the Your Next, Next Star campaign, it sounds like it was spoken about earlier today, but if you go to uh, yournextstar.com, um, there's some wonderful videos uh, of some of the people who have gone through the program, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing other people's experiences with, the, with it. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That's a really terrific story. And one of the things that just strikes me in um, hearing that story is uh, the depth of the friendships that develop. As we all know, we make very good friends at work. Uh, people with disabilities and people without disabilities do. And so the opportunities that come about as a result of including people in the workforce uh, go beyond the paycheck. 
Uh, Good job. Uh, Andy and Peter. Hi, thank you so much for uh, inviting me here and uh, well done for braving the weather. Uh, in, in England, we're calling this storm the beast from the east. Uh, I think <laughs> in Finland, they're calling it Wednesday, I think. Um, but just 90 seconds on who I am and, and, and why I'm here. My name is Peter Saville. I'm a managing director at Alex Partners based in our London office. Uh, we're a global business advisory uh, firm specializing in, in solving clients. Uh, what we say is their most difficult, complex, business critical, time critical problems, and they may be financial, operational, or digital. So we call them the um, when it really matters situations. Although <clears throat> when I describe it like that, my wife thinks that I want to be in the 80s TV show, The A-Team, um, which is true. Um, <clears throat> um, but just a, a few words, if I may, on why our involvement with the Down Syndrome Association is, is so important to us at Alex Partners. Uh, diversity, inclusion, and respect are absolutely critical pillars of our core values and culture at Alex Partners. <clears throat> And it isn't just because it's the right thing to do, of course, well, of course it is, but, but we also believe that a, a diverse workforce, an inclusive culture where people are accepted for who they are, and in, an environment of personal respect for people of every background is essential to the long-term success of our firm, and in all likelihood it's essential to the long-term success of your organisations as well. <clears throat> and we believe passionately and, and proudly that our diversity and inclusion agenda makes us uh, makes our business better uh, and makes us more successful. Um, our clients expect it, our staff demand it, <coughs> and at, at Alex Partners, we encourage every employee to embrace it, employer to embrace it, I'm sorry. Andy, maybe. So I'll just, I'll just add to that. So I, I'm a Andy Constable and I, I work alongside Peter in our London office. I'm the facilities manager. Um, I actually mentor my colleague Alfie. Um, when he's in the workplace since we started partnering with Veronica and the uh, DSA WorkFit program around three years ago. Um, while this responsibility is extremely high, I find the experience so rewarding, not only for myself, um, but for the entire London office, uh, most importantly for Alfie. Um, I'm honoured and extremely proud to be here today talking about my experience working with a person with Down syndrome uh, and look forward to discussing the challenges, benefits and any tips on building a successful and beneficial relationship. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, I'm a partner in a boutique litigation firm uh, here in the metropolitan area. And we, about a year ago, invited in Best Buddies to see if they couldn't pair with us an employee with Down syndrome to work in our law firm. Uh, it doesn't seem initially, oh, we have a clicker, I can, here we go. Oop, sorry, what button do I push? I think this one. Oh, okay. Uh, it didn't seem initially that we were uh, a good fit for somebody with uh, Down syndrome because the type of work that we do is a intense, high pressure, uh, at times high profile litigation. We do a lot of criminal defense work uh, state and federal courts, a lot of it's covered by the media. We do civil rights work and we also do some corporate immigration, EB-5 applications and things like that. The work is intense, there's a lot of pressure on the lawyers, so there is a lot of uh, uh, robust interaction, if you will, with the staff. But we felt strongly that we, we thought somebody could fit in and sure enough, it, it, they have. Here's a picture of us on our Cruise this past summer. Lizzie is right smack in the middle of everything, uh, who, is, who is our newest employee. Um, through practice areas. Oh, and there's some of the cases that we've handled. Um, oh. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's Lizzie with one of our paralegals. It's actually an interesting story. Uh, the gentleman on the right, Don Thompson, spent 17 years in state prison for a murder he did not con con commit. He was exonerated, now he's a paralegal. He's, he is a big, strong, tough guy, and for whatever reason, Lizzie and him, who is the biggest and smallest, have bonded in a way that's been truly amazing. They get along great, they eat lunch together, uh, they laugh at each other's jokes, and it's been a good interaction for her, for her, for Don, and really for everybody in the office. 
Lizzie's responsibilities include scanning emails, filing documents, assisting in the preparation of litigation documents, uh, preparing uh, intake packets, and a whole host of work that had to be done by the firm or by members of the firm anyway. And frankly, some of the tasks di weren't getting done well because people were being uh, pulled away from what they thought were their main function in order to, you know, file something. And fi we found that filing documents into the hard copies of the, in the literal files was never getting done because everybody thought they were too busy or didn't have to do it and it didn't matter. Lizzie's come in and taken care of a lot of that and it's been a challenge to some degree. Best Buddies has been great. They have brought in uh, an individual up to once a month or more often to help coach Lizzie on how to do things. And I recall the first week she was there, I asked the office administrator how it was going and she said, well, okay, but Lizzie made a mistake in, in uh, scanning the larger documents with the exhibit, so we're not going to have her do that anymore. And I said, well, no, let's teach her how to do that. And if you have somebody in our office that hasn't made a mistake, um, send them to me. I want to congratulate them because I don't know that person. Uh, so they did, and it's been, it's been working out great. She is a conscientious employee. She shows up on time, works hard, eats her lunch, goes home, and says every day, I love it here, and we love having her. And for me, that's a great thing. I, when I see her, I'm not in the office all the time. I'm, I'm out uh, frequently. I see her. I said, Lizzie, you still love it? She goes, I love it. And uh, as I said, she's really bonded with the other employees. Whoops. And, ah, sorry. Um, per point of personal privilege, that last slide is my daughter Maggie, who has Down syndrome, who will be a future member of the firm, uh, we hope, in, in, a, in a few more years, uh, which has obviously been my inspiration for moving this along. And uh, I think they're watching at home on UNTV, so I'll give a little shout out to my family and, of course, to our, our youngest. Thanks for having us. Bruce, that, and she is adorable, and uh, uh, you make a terrific point about the tasks that aren't getting done and how people can bring such extraordinarily, extraordinary value to the workforce. These high-profile cases that we have, she sees them on TV and knows that she had a hand in it, and truly she has. It's fabulous. And it's a good thing. Fabulous. Um, so I know that um, Heather and James did a little introduction this morning, but if you could say, I think it would be useful for me to hear, and others perhaps too, just to hear a little bit about your experience in hiring people, and then we'll go into some other questions. Sure. So, uh, as I as I mentioned this morning, we're we are a, uh, a financial services organization. We are located throughout the United States, and um, when we made this conscious decision, so similar to some of the other employers who have talked about, we are all about full inclusion. It has been part of our DNA. We have over half of our board members are female. We have very conscious uh, diversity around sexual orientation, ethnicity. So it's just this was just a natural extension of saying. We really want to be more inclusive of those within the special needs community. And when we started to go about doing our hiring and figuring about how do we get our organization ready to be able to hire those with intellectual disabilities, it was very much of a learning experience for us. And so there were several things that we did. Our partnership with NDSS has been critical. Um, but we had to, we actually created mandatory training for all of our employees around people first language. So understanding how people are speaking uh, to those in the community was really important. We wanted to make sure that we had that, that approach. Um, the other thing we did was really working and training our recruiters and hiring managers around interviewing and thinking about the job descriptions. And this most recently, the hire that I mentioned this morning, who started on Monday, we had folks from NDSS come and check out our facilities, uh, just really making sure that both our physical facilities as well as our web facilities, that we're in a good position to be able to bring somebody on board. And teaching our folks, we, we had the, this individual has an on-site job coach who is working closely with this new hire, as well as with us. So as we, I think the thing that was so eye-opening eye for our organization was 
this is not so much about teaching the candidate. This was about teaching us to make sure that we really were in an environment that was going to be create the best environment for them to succeed and for their coworkers to succeed. So we're super excited. We're still in the early phases, and I and I think the only other thing I would comment on is we've expanded and we've looked with we we've looked with other organizations more broadly in uh, the the community with intellectual disabilities beyond Down syndrome, around um, you know maybe those in the autism spectrum and the Asperger spectrum. Um, who are would do extremely well in many of our jobs in actuarial, in IT, finance, where that level of real focus um, is, is so key. So again, it's just something we're very excited about and uh, and looking forward to continue. Okay. James. Yeah. So um, I'll just tell you a very quick story about um, one of our other um, employees called Ben. And so Ben works in our Leeds laboratory, um, a highly technical. Um, organization and um, one day his team came in they got, got they got in late and Ben had been in there early and he'd been there for about an hour and he was sat there on a stool looking incredibly relaxed and his his team came in and thought oh we better you know get Ben going and, and see how he's doing and um, and they started chatting to him and, and realized that he'd actually been in and he'd done all the work and not only had he done all the work but he'd done it brilliantly and incredibly accurately and did it exactly how he was taught to do it um, during his training. And I think that's something that we've noticed with all of our candidates, is that they are, you know, when you explain it well and you explain it in the right way, they deliver it time and time again in the same way and exactly how you showed them. And, um, and from in a scientific organisation, that's exactly what you want. Um, so, you know, I just thought I'd share that. That's a Um, so let's get into some questions. Um, it's been good to get the full picture of everyone's experience, and those are some incredible stories. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about, sort of go back to the beginning of your hiring experience and um, think about either questions and concerns that either you had or that you heard from your colleagues or perhaps from HR. What were those and how did you resolve them? You're shaking your head. Have yeah, I'll, I'll uh, jump in. I'm shaking my head because I think originally we had to get over barriers of um, working with legal and HR. What happens if we hire somebody and it doesn't work out? Are we in a position where we've got a potential lawsuit on our hands? Um, we, I think, quickly got our folks beyond that as no more than you are with anybody else, right? Um, so I think that was really interesting. We initially had some difficulty with our um, head of recruiting, and we had everybody else was very much on board, and for some reason we couldn't get our arms around what the resistance was, where we had hiring managers who said, I am super excited. I, I, I totally believe that we're going to be able to bring in people who are just going to add to our whole culture. And there was resistance. I think the resistance was trying to figure out how do we approach the interview process and really identify whether they're right. And they, I think initially they were giving us excuses around, well, I don't know that the hiring managers are going to be on board. So we had to work, and, and that's why we, we spent a lot of time on the cultural because I think people initially had difficulty looking beyond the disability to see the ability. And that's where we've been trying to focus a lot more, more on cultural immersion to get people to say, at the end of the day, these are just people who want to work hard, who have unique skills and interests, and how do we find the right fit? Right, it sounds like you had great experience in overcoming those barriers. We, had a, we are a small firm, so we don't have the HR department. It really involves, you know, couple of the partners getting together but we 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 uh, I had it was my idea I'd been a participant with best buddies um, since my daughter was born and uh, I wanted to, to hire somebody uh, for a number of years and um, I had a great deal of resistance and I think part of it was that other people in the firm were afraid that rather than being an assistant that this person would be a, a problem, that would be charity, that uh, we'd have one more thing for somebody in the office to do, and that would be to watch out and kind of babysit this individual. And um, my feeling was that I, I didn't want to do charity. I could do that separately if I wanted to. I wanted to hire somebody that could help the firm. And um, it, it, it turns out that that's what we've done. 
Um, and we had the same questions about what if it doesn't work out? And I, my answer was, that's life, right? We, we hire people and it, it, they want to enter the workforce. I want them to. Uh, and hopefully it'll work out. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And you deal with it and you move on from both sides. Uh, so it, 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 the, the resistance, I don't know, for a bigger firm or a bigger corporation, I guess the issues are different. We have uh, 12 lawyers and number of staff people, so we're a total family of about 20. And overcoming the resistance there is really a question of personal persistence. And uh, Best Buddies was a, a big help. They came in and, and lectured to the entire staff, taught them, and, and paired us with somebody who really will be, has been successful so far and I hope will be in the future. Yeah, well, I, we had a similar experience in, in the UK um, and what we found as we're working with the WorkFit program in the UK, they were fantastic at giving our staff training on what it really meant and, and helping to break down those concerns, those barriers, those biases that the guys here have, have referred to. And I think once people understood that actually we weren't doing it for charity, uh, we genuinely believed that this is, was right at the heart of what we wanted our firm to do and believe in, and it was good for business. And once that kind of switch went for, for people and they got that, um, then they embraced it, and it's been great from there. All your endorsements as we go about uh, representing job seekers, because these are great stories. James, you... Button. Um, yeah, just to reflect, really, I mean, we, again, work with WorkFit, and um, they came in and we did lunch and learn sessions where, essentially, we invited anybody that was there that day could just come along and have a listen about what we were going to do and have discussions about, you know, to get some of their worries out and aired. Um, one of the key ones was people were concerned about um, saying the wrong thing, using a, a phrase or a, or a term that may offend a potential colleague. Um, and actually, once you know, work fit had been in and sat down with us and gone through that and removed that fear, everybody just felt in, you know, instantly more comfortable. And um, so, yeah, I, I think you know, getting everybody involved and making it a, a whole organisational thing is key. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo that as well, to be honest, from the, the relationship we had with the, the DSA mm. uh, programme is that when they come in and they did the, the workshops, the lunch and learns, it absolutely just turned everyone as Pete said it flicked the switch it gave everyone a clear understanding of how this can work and how it can be beneficial to to everyone involved so massive thumbs up to them for that Margaret I'm wondering if you can take it from slightly a different point of view I know you told me before it sounds like PwC has done an enormous amount and has a terrific uh, 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 inclusion program and you're just working your way toward hiring. Could you talk a little bit about the thought process and what's going on there? Sure, yeah. So one of the things that we've been careful about is we're a really large professional services organization, um, you know, and I'm from the Boston office, but we're looking nationally as well. And one thing we want to do is just be really prepared. Um, so with the firm's uh, advancement and continuing to um, empower people for diverse firm environment and inclusion. We've really been careful about um, investigating the organizations we want to work with for potential, um, you know, partnering with job skills and job coaches um, and making sure that when we do take the step for somebody with Down syndrome, and we've made steps um, in directions for other disabilities um, on, in, you know, autism and um, different spectrum um, disabilities, we want to be prepared for it to be successful. So that's, you know, the, we're in the research stage and figuring out who the best partner is for us both on a local and a national level for those various um, endeavors. Great, thanks. Um, I'd like to take just a little break. I understand that there is a question in the audience uh, from Alex Lee. Is Alex here? Good afternoon. My name is Alex, and I'm 10 years old. My question is, what are some of the things that you feel are important for
for the students who are in elementary school to focus on for better employment options in the future. Thank you. So, um, down with Andy, and, and you can answer Alex's question, if you would. Um, yeah, I mean, looking at it from, from that point of view, I think um, it's hopefully getting a, some partnership out in the schools as well, I'd imagine. That, that would be key. Um, in the UK, I know that's something that happens a lot, uh, again, through the WorkFit programme. So it's just building those um, relationships at that age so that it puts them... Uh, in the best position as they get older and have that ability to go into the workplace when they hit that age, um, that they're, they're, they're perhaps had a bit of training, a bit of experience, work experience maybe. Just I think in the UK we looked at two-week periods initially uh, as an option before you could then look at more permanent employment. So um, I would say you, you need to take a lot of advice and guidance again from whoever you're partnered with in, in, your, in your area and, and hopefully they can start getting into schools at an earlier age rather than wait until uh, latter uh, college years, perhaps. Exactly. <laughs> Hello, Alex. Um, I think it's about trying lots and lots and lots of things and looking for that thing that really inspires you and that makes you want to go on and then, and then working really hard on communication skills. That's one of the key things in any business, any organisation you go into. It's all about developing those communication skills, and it sounds like you're starting off from a very good position. So well done. Yeah, I, I, Alex, I have to tell you, I have two boys, 16 and 18, and I wish when they were 10 they asked the same question that you did. Um, you know, I, I think a couple things. I would build on the communication, and I would talk about work ethic and trying new things. And if you have opportunities as you go through school to do summer jobs, help around that commitment of a work ethic. I, I think that is something that, that regardless of what type of industry you're interested in working for, people look for the work ethic. Uh, it, it, it strikes me that it's the same for all of us, right? Um, you need to be able to read and write and add and communicate. Um, so those basics are the key for my 10-year-old and for any other 10-year-old, um, like you said, I wish my, my kids would have, have those questions posed to them instead of how can we get out of our homework tonight. Um, but really, the basics and then follow your passion. I'm a strong believer that uh, if I can, God has paired your inner desires and passion with your abilities. And if you follow uh, what you really want to do and work towards it, you'll find that you have the talent and the ability to do that. Yeah, I, c I completely agree with you, Bruce. I think um, a great question, Alex. And it really is about doing what you want to do. I say this to my four children. Um, I think one of them at least listens. Um, um, but look, you'll be working for a long time, so do something you enjoy, and you enjoy it, you'll be good at it. And there's no better advice for any child looking to move into business is no different for you but well done yeah, guys you mind if i jump in here real quick no please do i was gonna i was gonna call on you and i'm sure. sorry for not so please yeah. jump no not, not a problem i i think equal to um uh the the working hard and the following pat your passion is is to is to put yourself out there and to and to network and to find these opportunities. Um, I think the more people who you meet and who you engage um, can't help but be impressed by you and, and, be, and be excited about what you can offer to them as a, as a full-fledged member of their, of their team. Um, and um, I, and that, that I, I wish I had done that myself when I, when I was a, um, a young lawyer coming up, instead of pushing away the help that I might have gotten from parents and friends and saying that I can do this on my own, I'll figure it out, um, it was exponentially harder than it was to, to rely on that network to get out there and to create relationships um, because those are going to be um, your paths to, um, to new opportunities and better opportunities. So, um, 
So in addition to all of those things that I think are, are 100% uh, accurate and really important, um, uh, take it upon yourself to put yourself out there. Thank you. Yeah, Alex, I think my two cents is that uh, similar to what everyone's saying, not being afraid to try something new and fail. Um, it's really in finding your passion, I think you're going to try a bunch of different activities and figuring out what that is. I think as Bruce was said earlier, everybody gets things wrong sometimes. And so in those failures, you can actually learn more um, and more about yourself and what you want to be doing. Alex, thank you again. You really elicited some very good advice and some very good points. Thank you. Jonathan, can I circle back to you? Because I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I didn't get to you first time around and ask you to talk no a little problem. bit about the first question and the concerns, questions, issues you might have confronted as you included someone in your office. I, I'll tell you, the, the, the biggest problem was self-imposed. It took me a long time to figure out how to present this to my partners. Um, and, and of course, once I did, uh, they were like, well, of course we're gonna do this. This is amazing. What, why didn't you bring this to us sooner? So I, I think that um, you know, I, I, people um, need to recognize in themselves and, and get over sort of their own um, inhibitions and fears and worries and trust your, trust your people um, that um, they're gonna be into this as much as you are. Um, so that would, be, that would sort of be my advice. Thanks. Um, the next question I have may be a little bit self-serving since I represent an organization that represents job seekers, but a number of you mentioned working with job coaches and Margaret, you talked about searching for the right partner. So those of us who do, for those of us who do represent job seekers, how can we be a good partner to you? What, what, how do you recommend that we think about this and develop that partnership? Um, so I think that in, what, in terms of looking for um, the job coaches and the, the, for the job seekers, I know that we're looking for organizations that understand the work we do in a professional services environment and um, can help us identify, we've been working to identify as you and I discussed the positions that we have already in place and how best to incorporate individuals into those positions. Um, it's also very important, I think, that it's been touched on the concerns that current employees have and making sure we can help address those internally um, to make people more at ease and not just at ease and comfortable with, but excited about the inclusion. So, so we, like most uh, professional services firms, are, are focused on growth. Um, and I, I think we're not unusual in the fact that uh, we see very few diverse CVs, resumes landing on our desks. By the time they get to senior executives, they have been filtered a number of times. And that's a problem because what, what you usually see is that in... You know, most organizations have a very noble mission statement that talks about diversity inc and inclusion, yet when you get to actually choose, you're not seeing the CV. So I think um, more needs to be done to empower our HR teams um, to really um, follow through on the things that we say we want to do as organizations, empower them, give them the permission to uh, be creative in the way that they look for people um, uh, to, to put across your desk and to stop filtering them too soon, um, and, and and so that's one way of that's one way of doing it. And I think you know um, uh, uh, organisations like yours can help ours just to to, to understand that. <clears throat> um, but that sort of bias, of course, isn't just about disability. It can be economic, and it can be race, it can, you know, ethnicity, um, gender. Um, and so what we also try to do at Alex Partners is actually go down into the root of it because a lot of it is. Um, a lot of the problem, we think, is people not getting the right education because they're not giving the opportunity. So if we can help very early on, and I'm talking about in, in, in primary school, to help them get into better schools so that we do see the CVs on merit, and that's really what we want, that's what we want to see. That's inspiring. Uh, Jonathan, can I jump to you on that? Um. Sure. I, I think that um, what's been said pretty much sums it up. Uh, you know, the... Uh, the, the, 
as much as we interview candidates, I think these job coaches should interview the firm, you know, and really find out what, what um, the firm's needs are, um, uh, learn about the business, the structure, who are the key contacts. Um, one of the things that I think was really effective for us was we had sort of um, a peer mentor relationship set up for, for Katie when she came on. The, the job coach, Katie had done so well that she, only, she was only with her for less than a month, I'd say, and then Katie was pretty much on her own um, from, you know, leaving the house in the morning, getting on the mass transit, fly, walking from mass transit to the office, coming up to our office and getting to work. Um, uh, she 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 mastered it pretty quickly, but uh, which allowed which allowed the coach to step back, um, you know, in, in a similar manner. But what we had um, in place uh, of the job coach once she left was these was a couple of peer mentors who do similar work to what Katie does, um, and with whom she was able to um, ask questions um, and confirm when she had doubt, you know, for whatever it was that she was doing. So. I think those two things, I, I would have, I would make sure that the job coaches I interview the firms as much as we interview the candidate. And then I would suggest to the, to the, the, to the employers that they have peer mentorships available um, for the candidates once they come in. I particularly like that peer mentorships. Thanks. That's great. Bruce, I think you said you worked with best buddies. Am I right? We did. And, and they were, um, they were, were and continue to be quite helpful. But it, it occurs to me as I'm, I'm listening that this is not dissimilar to what uh, a headhunter might do. If I needed a litigation associate, I would call up, or I, I may have, call up somebody and say, look, here's our need. And that, they'd go out and find somebody with talents and abilities that would fit that need. This isn't any, any different where um, we found ourselves with, I mean, initially it was a desire to bring somebody in. But then we looked around and said, where can we, where do we have a need? And the answer was in some of the filing and the scanning and the, the tasks that need to be done every day that people weren't getting to. And so we went to Best Buddies and said, this is what we have. And they were able to fit somebody. And there needed to be skill sets that, that that person had, right? They had to be organized. They needed to obviously know the alphabet and be able to read and so forth. But matching uh, needs of the employers with the talents of the uh, applicants is a pretty basic thing. And it's something that we all do without thinking. And, same thing would apply here, I think. You're right. It's a very basic thing. Not always happening, though. But I think, I think that's an incredibly good point. Heather? Yeah, I would add two things. Um, I think number one is sharing examples like this has been done here of other successes. Um, I know for us, we actually had E&Y come in and talk about their program. And there was something about you hear from somebody else of what they've done with the hiring that really helps you and, and makes it more accessible within your own organization. And the second is to give us feedback on our recruiting efforts and how we come across. Um, one thing I'd share is we, we had some of our recruiters go out to a job fair in New York City last year, and the intention was to broaden our net so we were getting candidates, broad candidates, who, who may have had disabilities. And one of the feedback was, was just even the visual, the poster that was used, and, and it was a bit of a, a stereotypical white man in a wheelchair. And so there was the question around people like you can give organizations who want to do the right thing, but we may not always be projecting ourselves in the way that is the most inviting for candidates with different abilities to come to work for us. Um, yeah, so with Workfit, um, I would say the, the key thing was that they came in and learnt the job that we needed to fill. So it wasn't just us sending them a piece of paper with, we would like a laboratory assistant. It, they actually came in and spent half a day looking at the job, watching watching somebody else do it, and then were able to go away and, and really, you know, look at their database of people with the right sort of skills and then come back to us with... Um, with fantastic candidates every time. And I think just having that in-depth knowledge of the, of the ask, the request, that's, that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. you, can I just add one more thing Please, as, yeah. as, as well? Um, one of the things that we're also thinking about at Alex Partners is helping people with their CVs. And that may be, um, for instance, giving them three or four weeks of work experience. So rather than having one person long-term for a few years, we roll 10 people through our London office and 10 people through our New York office. And... Um, of course, that means that there are lots and lots of people who are able to say, look, I've done this for 
four weeks at Alex Partners or PwC or which other organization, which we think is a way of just providing much more um, c confirmation um, and uh, to, to other potential employers who might be a bit nervous, not quite sure whether it works. They can get a reference from Alex Partners or another big organization, and we think that that's, that's powerful. And I think you know, many other organizations who are strong advocates of this should really think about doing that kind of thing. That's a very powerful tool, as you say. I agree. Andy, anything to add? Yeah, just, just what James t touched on, really, with was regard to the initial approach from WorkFit. Um, it was a case of sitting down. We worked together to pull together what we wanted the job to look like. Then that helped um, Veronica pull from the pool of candidates that they've got to see what, what would work. And, and the key point and one of the big pluses that I felt from this whole process was that um, I actually felt empowered to be a mentor myself. So um, I, I felt like that was important to build that relationship originally. Um, at one point, there was a time where it was extremely busy in the office and I did look at possibly getting a job coaching as well to perhaps broaden the, the tasks that Alfie was capable of doing. Um, but again, because he's developed so well over the period of time he's been with us, it isn't anything we, we needed to progress. So it's just continued with me as his mentor, which is extremely rewarding for me. And you're another advertisement for peer mentors. Absolutely. Um, so we don't have a lot of time left. Um, I have another question that, that is somewhat self-serving, but I am so inspired, truly, truly, by hearing all of you. I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to sit with such an incredible group of employers, so thoughtful. So my question is, can you think about ways that you can also inspire your colleagues and help open more doors? Do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, so I can start if you like. Um, for me, inspiring colleagues is about awareness. So um, one of the most powerful tools that I've seen lots of them today actually is using media. So using the videos. Um, what first got me involved actually was um, I had the idea, but then um, the Down Syndrome Association videos showing all these amazing candidates in work and thriving and doing really well. And um, as soon as I'd seen them, that was it. I, I knew we had to be involved. So for me, you know, those real life examples and sharing them um, in that way is you know, incredible. That's good advice. You know, the, the, um, we all have problems. Um, every one of us does, right? I'm distracted easily and procrastinate often. And so every one of our employees, the, the, from the most talented lawyer down to uh, the least talented lawyer, has some issues. And it's always a balancing test, isn't it? The pluses plus compared to the minuses is this person work for our firm. And I think that's certainly true for people with Down syndrome, except their problems, if you will, are obvious, right? They are, they're visible, they're audible, and, and they're immediate. And I think overcoming that to, to tell people to look to their skills, to their abilities, to their qualities, and then do the same balance that you would do for any other employee. Just because you can't see the well-dressed candidate with the sharp CV, what their downside is, immediately you know they have one. And part of hiring is to dig that out and, and weigh the pluses and minuses. So I would urge firms or employers to, to engage in the same process you do all the time. Look at your needs and make, a, make that balance. And what you're going to find out is that people with Down syndrome can make a real contribution to your firm. They can do real good work. And from personal experience, we have a small place, so it's everybody knows everybody. It's been a positive experience for our employees as well as our clients. So, um, so we, I mean, our organization, to give you some context, about 2,500 employees. Um, so not huge, but it's a, a lot of people logistically to, to buy into one vision and one strategy. And what we think is it's absolutely critical. It starts at the top. I know it's a cliche. But, but, but the CEO has to be absolutely clear on the, on the vision for this and his belief in, um, in, in this. He then needs very strong advocates um, through his senior leadership um, organization. Um, and, and, and he also needs to link it to business strategy as well. 
it's not just this is the right thing to do, as I was saying earlier. It's actually this is why it's important for the business and this is why it makes a difference and makes our business better. Um, and then below that, it, it, I think it's about having initiatives that people can relate to. So in Alex Partners, we have employee resource groups and it, and it might be you know women empowerment or LBGTQ. It might be... Um, you know, um, a, a black group, whatever. is a whole group of them. There's about um, 10 or 15 employee resource groups. Um, and over 60% of our employees are members of one of those groups. So you take it down to the local level and people buy into something that they believe in. And this just becomes another part of what they believe in, what is right. And frankly, that's what we do at our organisation. It's part of the culture and the, and the fabric. So that's how I think you make the, the success of it. Yeah, I would add um, two two things. Number one, when we first started doing it, our employees said, "Look, don't don't start with the end customer first. Start with us." So we went out to every single location and we did focus groups on every campus. And the amazing thing that happened was uh, people self-identified with their own family situation that they typically would not before. And so we created a culture of full acceptance that people just feel comfortable to talk about their own personal situation. And um, I think role modeling the hiring, we said we're going to do it, and we didn't just say, all right, we're going to go find jobs in the call center or another area. Um, my boss, who is the CEO of one of our business units, he said, you and I are hiring the first person, and they're going to work for us. And so the fact that we're going to have somebody who's very visible, who's working for senior leaders, I think that just opens up the role modeling because people see and they want to emulate. And I like that when people come to see your CEO. They see what you're doing. So Margaret, Jonathan, Andy, did you? Yep. Yeah. Um, I was going to jump in. And like Peter said, about the employee resource groups. Um, so that's you know my place in the organization right now. And one thing we've been doing is while we're working on this hiring journey and we're addressing the business need and getting everyone behind it from that perspective, um, we are holding inclusion events, national webcasts, local events. We're bringing in our partners like Mass Down Syndrome Congress, other people who are currently employing professional employments to just broaden everyone's awareness of what's in the community right now and that we may be not where we want to be if we want to be ahead of the game and leading. Um, and just making sure that when some, we do get to the point where we are hiring, that the culture is there to support it fully and on board. Andy and Jonathan, and then I think we're going to have to stop. Am I right, Andrew? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'll say I've learned a lot um, just listening to the to the panel, um, and, and um, I, it's been really uh, helpful to me about how we how we can spread the word and, and inspire our own people and our own networks and beyond. Um, I think the one thing that hasn't been touched on um, completely is um, it's sort of the social media component to this. Um, I, I had recently done a presentation on an ethics panel where I got into some of, some of the metrics. It, it dealt with really investigations of claims and, and, and what you can get from social media. And I think it's applicable here too. You have you know, uh, 500 million users of LinkedIn and three quarters of the population who's on Facebook. And, um, uh, yeah, you know, YouTube and Snapchat and all, all the all the all the tools that are available to us to spread this message um, uh, of hope and dignity and um, and accomplishment. And um, I, you know, I, I I'd like to find more ways for us to do that and to partner with some of the um, some of the great organizations like the Mass Down Syndrome Congress and Dust Buddies and the like to to continue to spread that word. Andy's going to end end this panel. <laughs> uh, well, I was going to go down the social media discussion as well, but I'll, Jonathan stole my thunder there, unfortunately. But no, one, one of the things I'd like to say that I do personally is um, just in any contractor meetings, any supplier meetings, I take Alfie with me. Um, it's a great experience for him. It can then perhaps help uh, people outside of our business see what we're doing and then hopefully take an interest in that as well and then... Uh, I know one of the one of our contractors has certainly started to open discussions um, within their business on doing something similar to what we've done. So again, overexposure of any situations like that is a, is a hundred percent a great a great thing to do. Thanks. Thank you, and thanks to all of you. It was really a terrific discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So everybody, if, uh, if you could just wait for a couple of minutes while we swap the nameplates over, and then we'll begin the second hour. Okay, so we have nameplates swapped over, so if guys could start making their way back down. And can I just say before we start, uh, for the benefit of anybody who wasn't here this morning, um, Jose Maria, uh, just there, will speak in Spanish. So in front of you, um, you have a, an earpiece. And if you, when Jose Maria's turn to speak, if you operate the channel button on the top right-hand corner and move it to channel one English and make sure the volume is up and you put this earpiece on, you'll be able to hear in uh, pristine English what Jose Maria is saying. Thank you. 
Okay, is this working? Okay, everybody, I'd just like to hand over to Ben Drew and we'll begin this panel. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna now carry on. We're gonna sort of build on uh, Feder's uh, panel and talk a little bit more about um, experiences benefits, challenges of employing people with Down syndrome and developmental disabilities. Um, for th so for this portion, uh, we have Peter again from Alex Partners. We also have from La Casa de Carlota in Spain. We have Jose Maria Batea um, from DABA, which is a exclusive distri distributor of Nespresso. We have Carlos Carriero and Monse Sunier. And from Rabobank, we have Tommy Flynn and Chad Piera. So um, as an audience, you should already know Jose Maria from this morning. So I'm just going to introduce myself, and then I will ask the other presenters to introduce themselves. Um, I've been working in the field of developmental disabilities for the, the last 20 years. Um, you'll hear people who work in this field will talk about how passionate they are. I will just say that I am really, really, really passionate about developmental disabilities. Um, previously in the UK, I established a service called Options that provided support to people. Um, we helped people buy or rent their own homes and then uh, help them to manage their own and services. Um, more recently, I established Open Future Learning, which is an online learning provider 100% uh, dedicated to the field of developmental disabilities. Um, we try to think really creatively about how we can change the way people think about learning online within our field. Uh, more recently, we launched, launched a feature of the site called Side by Side Learning, which uh, enables people with developmental disabilities to learn online alongside and with the people that support them. So that is me. I will now turn this over to Carlos and Monsi to introduce themselves. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Hello, 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 good afternoon. Hey, yeah, see. Uh, uh, my name is Carl. Director uh, for Daba Nespresso. Nespresso, um, uh, the, the uh, exclusive distributor of Nespresso capsules in, in Spain. And uh, I'm accompanied here by Monse Sunier. Gracias, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Monse Sunier. I'm the national boutique manager of Daba Nespresso in Spain. Uh, I really thank you the opportunity uh, to give us showing how we work with Down syndrome in our company. And now I'm going to, to change in Spanish because I, I feel more comfortable and I hope it's not a, a problem for, for everyone. So in this case, we can follow. Okay. Muy bien. What is DABA? DABA is the exclusive distributor of Nespresso in Spain since uh, 1993. Uh, today will be, this year will be the 25th anniversary and is the exclusive distributor not only of Spain, but also Andorra, uh, Morocco, Ar Argelia, and Japan. 
during these last 25 years of collaboration, DABA has positioned itself as one of the uh, relevant uh, markets uh, and in Valium is now the fifth market. Uh, right now it is in, uh, in DABA. In DABA, not only we sell uh, coffee and espresso, but what we really do is to uh, employ people, to hire people. Today in the organization we have over 1,300 people in the seven markets. Um, around Europe and Africa. Our mission, uh, which then I will explain later on, is based on the excellence, uh, not only in uh, how it is done excellently, but in the excellency of people. Since 2008, uh, 10 years ago, we have worked with the uh, Aura Fund Foundation in the inclusion, uh, in, inclu in the inclusion with uh, people with Down syndrome and other intellectual uh, nos gustaría okay. um, we will also um, it, it's been very moved being here today we met beautiful people yesterday we got to meet you all most of you guys and it's been two great days all together and the first thing is like we both are honored to be here and we both are honored to be able to share these two days with you guys, because it's it's been one of our our lifetime experience. Um, being said that, um, we do think uh, we um, each company has its own way of being, mm -hmm. and let me let me say it this way: uh, each company has its own heart, and what we are going to uh, share with you today is a little piece of it, a little piece of our heart that is composed, as Monsa said, by almost 1,400 people, 22 of them with Down syndrome. And they're exactly, and we do employ some other people with some other different capabilities, but um, 22 individuals with Down syndrome, which is what would take us today here. and. In order to continue with a with a brief presentation, okay, we have it's one click. There we go. Monse. Uh, we want to continue being excellent every day to become a reference, and not only for the Nespresso brand, but for other Nespresso markets and companies. Here you can look at our values. It's uh, results in goal-oriented, customer-focused, teamwork. Teamwork includes all of us. And then Carlos, and probably during the discussion, is one of the topics we would like to go more into depth. That is, at the end of the day, uh, intellectual uh, disabilities are part of the daily doing in our team. It is teamwork that is good for the team, for the current team of uh, the business. Here we will tell you how and what is the daily dynamics, ethical principles, commitment, and proud to belong to the brand and looking for excellence. Carlos? Working with Aura Foundation, uh, it's been our partner, the first partner we had on this project. And uh, we've, we've been also working with some others, but um, the main partner for us is, is uh, Aura. Aura. Uh, in all the social and labor inclusion of Down syndrome people, the, the thing we, we, were, we were discussing earlier, and we said, okay, um, we do employ Down syndrome individuals, but not just at, at HQ level, because we truly believe it's, it's, it's easy. I mean, we adapt position, et cetera. What we do is employ Down syndrome people in our boutiques, facing customers, being part of our, <laughs> our teams like a regular like a regular guy or girl there, and um, 
sometimes it's tough because we need to, like, first start with a position and uh, evaluating what they, um, what their abilities and, and likes are. And Aura help us a lot, a lot with your mentoring process with that. And then we um, we start training them and and helping them overcoming first uh, doubts and reluctances and things. All the teams are really involved because at the very end, they need to attend our customers. And there has to be, we're, we're very, we're very, um, we look for excellence, as Monsa stated before, and, and each customer has uh, the right to be attended in the best possible way, and that's something we're not going, we're not going to abandon. That's an idea we're not going to abandon, uh, even though we employ Down syndrome people. Therefore, we adapt the positions to them, and, and also we ask them for, for a real high standard. They, they get used to it little by little, but um, that's something we're really proud of. If you go to our boutiques in, in, in Spain or you visit us, you will see people interacting with the customers in a very direct way. And sometimes they, you know, they do their things and, and do it exceptionally or make mistakes. And that's okay. I remember one when, uh, when situation we had with, with our customer. She uh, asked for a coffee. You, you know the Nespresso business? You know, there is... There is a carpe diem. It's a place where you can you can have a coffee. You can you can relax there after your shopping. And they, um, our coffee specialists prepare coffee, a recipe, or whatever. And then there was this uh, this customer coming uh, asking for a coffee, and she finally said, "Okay, the milk is not warm enough. It's cold." And our coffee specialist, which uh, was uh, has like uh, uh, she she has a special. Uh, she has a special or different abilities. She put her finger in the coffee, <laughs> took it out and said, it's hot. <laughs> Imagine the face of the customer at that point in an espresso shop, all poshy, everything. And that customer's, uh, that, that coffee specialist put in her finger in the customer's coffee. Then it was, it was a mess. Then we needed to, I, I was there. I was, um, um, it was, it was a, uh, it was something that happened. I, I was there. I was in a, in a visit, and I saw that. And all the, all the, you know, the, the, the boutique manager, the system boutique manager, went to the, to the customer. She was starting raising her voice and, and feeling uncomfortable. We explained she was in an in a integration process, and, and she was kind of like um, uh, new to the position, et cetera. And, and when she found out, she was, she, was, she was moved. She was touched. She was blessed. She was, she was trying to hug the, the coffee specialist. She, <coughs> she didn't understand why. But, but, but it, was, it was things like this happened to us. And we need to be ready. We need to be prepared to make real life, not to protect them. Sometimes we tend to protect uh, our Down syndrome people excessively. And we need to normalize that. And we all make mistakes. We do all make mistakes. Why can't they do them? Why do we have to uh, overprotect them from that, from making mistakes? And that's one of the things. As you can see here, uh, we started out in 2008 uh, with our foundation, who were there, with four people. And now, 10 years later, we employ 22. This has been a program of um, almost 50 people going through the process. You know, we've, we've been hiring. Some of, some of them have stayed. Some of them have moved to different positions. Some of them, we have had to decline them because they have not adapted themselves. And that's a reality. OK. Is that it, Carlos? Sorry. Well, just one more. OK. This is just the last. I'm sorry. Uh, I was taking, taking over time. And we truly believe this is thanks to Deba team. Uh, we think we are creative people, flexible, innovative, <coughs> committed. And we call it positive people. That's a concept. We, uh, we gather, we create, we came up with four years ago, and we've been developing this, this concept through throughout these four years, and we're really proud of it. We are really proud of our people. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> so now we will turn over to Tommy and Chad from Rabobank. Yeah, yeah, hi. Uh, Tommy Flynn. Um, Thank you very much for the invite. We're uh, very pleased and proud to be here today. Uh, I'm here with Chad Pereira, uh, our Head of Facilities, and Chad will introduce himself in a minute. 
So my name is Tommy Flynn, and I'm Chief Operating Officer for Rabobank in Europe, uh, which means I run all of the IT operations uh, across the Europe region. Um, I'm first going to talk a few words about Rabobank itself, because a lot of people will hear the words bank, and uh, in the UK you can say banker, and it rhymes with things that people like to say about it. So uh, I'll say a few words about who we are as a bank and why we are as a bank. Uh, Rabobank was set up just over 100 years ago, and it's a cooperative, so we don't have shareholders. All of our money goes back into the community, and uh, our mission, I guess, as senior custodians of the bank is to hand on the bank in a stronger position to the next generation. Um, we were set up for, to provide Dutch farmers with access to the financial markets. So in other words, in order to be able to get them to borrow money to grow crops, etc. So our mission currently is growing a better world together. So it's something we passionately believe in, that we want to have a positive impact. So if you were to ask our CEO, uh, what is your mission? What do you believe in? What do you want? Um, most CEOs of banks would talk around how many, you know, return on equity, return on shareholder value, great customer service and all that. And okay, that's important. Um, but our CEO would say that his most important thing is having a positive impact on society. So I'm very proud to work for an organization who actually wants us as individuals to go out and do great things and to actually have our own positive impact on society. Um, I also, in my role, um, do a lot of the interviews for the senior talent programs. So one of the standard questions we have on our senior talent program is talk to me about what you've done to make a positive impact on your local society. So, and the reason local is very important is it is important to be attached to your local community. So it's very, very interesting when you see people who can't answer that question, um, and there are many of them. But actually you more than often see people light up when they get that question and talk about something and then you can really feel the passion coming out. So it is a great way to turn a quite a, a dull, boring interview into something that really, really comes alive. Um, about a year ago, uh, Chad and I started uh, on our little mission to, uh, to offer somebody the opportunity who was distant from the workplace. So say, we're going to give someone an opportunity within our bank uh, to join us. Um, quite quickly, we met Veronica at um, Workfit. Um, who were excellent to be able to help us in preparing ourselves. And trust me, it was more about preparing ourselves rather than the candidates. Um, and to be honest, when we started off, we said, let's do something nice for somebody. So we, in a bank, let's do something nice. Hmm. Um, but we were completely wrong. Um, we weren't doing something nice at all. Um, and that's something that we learned on our journey. Um, because we have gained much more than anything we've given. So the actual return for us was hugely positive for the bank, rather than any other way, and also. So after about, about six months ago, we met with um, a candidate um, that Victoria, um, or Veronica, sorry, had, um, had brought to our attention, Shamari. Uh, so we met with him, uh, his mum, his dad, uh, and we had a chat. So we didn't have an interview, we had a nice chat. Uh, and it was lovely. Um, and I definitely, we didn't ask any difficult questions when we found out that Shamari also had a black belt in, uh, in martial arts. So, uh, so we were very nice and respectful to him. Uh, but yeah, no, so, so quite quickly, we decided that Shamari, we would love to work with Shamari and have Shamari work with us. Um, and he has started now working two days a week. Um, he goes to college the other three. Um, because his mum, fantastic person, says she wants him to have a group of people who also are getting ready for work and are friends of his who also face similar uh, challenges, etc. So he's going to college three days a week working with us too. He finishes college in, uh, in the summer and we hope to be able to increase uh, those hours. But the thing I finally point that I want to focus on is something that as senior management in banks we talk about all the time and that's culture. Um, everyone knows the banking industry since the financial crisis has been through an incredibly difficult time um, and we've really had to look at ourselves in the mirror and talk about culture. Do we have the right culture within the bank? We spend an awful lot of time and effort uh, 
and funds on various consultants talking about how can we bring a positive culture into the bank. And I have sat in off-sites in all the sessions talking about culture and how we can do it. You know, the old saying, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It is about culture. Um, and the reason I want to talk about culture is something we hadn't even thought about, but bringing uh, Shamari and somebody who happens to have Down syndrome in with the positive attitude they show every day in the work they do, which, you know, it rubs off on other people. You know, we talk about our organizational health index, <coughs> things like this, having fun, having people smile, Shamari going around, doing his job, delivering the post, being the face of the bank, going, talking to everybody. That only helps. That only increases engagement, increases pos um, positivity. And that's the culture that we need within a bank. So, to be honest, hiring somebody with Down syndrome has been an enormously positive experience for us as a bank. Um, something that we're keen to talk to other employers about and spread that message out there that actually rather than viewing it as some type of CSR thing that you're doing something nice, actually as an institution, you can get an awful lot more out of it um, than you think. So as a banker, it's on the positive side of the balance sheet. So it's definitely something that, uh, that we want to pursue. And I think the final point I want to leave you with is um, in the UK, only 6% of people with Down syndrome are in paid employment. So what I would say is, let's change that. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Um, Chad, I don't know if you have any really brief yeah. thoughts, and then we're gonna, we need to really crack on then. Thanks, Drew. Uh, just, just obviously echoing on, uh, on what Tommy said, um, I work with Tommy at Rotherbank. I'm the head of facilities. Um, Tommy used, used the phrase, I, I did a lot of the heavy lifting um, with this initiative, but to be honest with you, it, 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 it was a joy. I think um, echoing on, on a lot of the, the topics which were um, covered earlier, I think it was important for us to actually partner with a specialist. Um, you know, we are by no means specialists. I, I don't have any personal vest, vested interest um, in Down syndrome at all, but I did have a, a vested interest in actually making uh, Rowbank a better place to work. So uh, Tommy sent me a YouTube video um, on Down syndrome with WorkFits and literally the next day we started the journey. Um, I think what was key again was to actually, as I said, partner up with a specialist, which is WorkFit, um, you know, have somebody to actually allay all the fears, all the ignorance, um, and actually find the right candidate for, for the right position. Um, that was absolutely key for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, you know, we've had some really great examples today about how um, employing people with Down syndrome and developmental disabilities has changed the culture within companies and people's perspective of disability. So I thought it might just be interesting now, let's just flip this a little bit. Um, why don't we talk about um, some of the challenges um, you know, what didn't work out as you imagined it would, and maybe some personal stories and examples around that, and thinking about what didn't work, what would you do differently if you could rewind time and uh, go, go back, and uh, you know, how is it changing how you move forwards now in terms of in your company, how it works with its employees more broadly, and specifically with people with developmental disabilities. So. So what didn't work? And I sort of encourage anybody here on the panel to, to jump in. Actually, it's probably Andy who can answer that um, better. I, I certainly remember at our Christmas party, what didn't work was keeping Alfie off the red wine. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> no, what I, some of the challenges we face is... Um, and again, it goes back to the initial point when there was this bias that all people with Down syndrome are happy, um, which couldn't be further from the truth. They're exactly the same as every single one of us. So there will be good days with Alfie, there'll be bad days with Alfie. Um, days when he's come into the office and not wanting to do the task that we've given him. Um, I can think of examples where he had something planned socially outside of the workplace and all his focus was 
on getting to that point as quick as he po possibly could. So therefore, perhaps didn't have the same output he would normally have in the workplace as if it was a normal day. Um, I think one of the the key things for for myself working with Alfie is is having that fun element to it as well. So yes, we want him to be productive in the office. We want it to be beneficial to him. We want him to, want him to add value to our workspace. Um, but it's important that he enjoys his time while he's with us. So during his lunch break, um, over the last <coughs> probably six to seven months, we've been working on a, a short film that he's really passionate about, um, a 004 James Bond type <laughs> film, um, which, yeah, is, is something that he, he's, you can tell he's passionate about. It. it just breaks up the day a little bit, which, like all of us during the working day, sometimes you need a little break from what you're doing. Again, it's no different for for any any. Uh, individual with Down syndrome so they're kind of some of the challenges we we faced and and how we would try and deal with those scenarios and, and Andy hits on a very good point I think uh, one, one of the many biases about employing people with Down syndrome is is people believe that it's just one homogenous group of, um, of, of of actions and they all act exactly the same and of course that's we all know that's a nonsense but you know the people in this room are advocates for this um, so, so, so breaking that down and actually just simply treating people as individuals. Um, and we've talked a bit about training today, um, but actually um, we see it as more on that, more than that. It's actually giving development opportunities as well. It's, it, it isn't saying you're coming in to do this job and that's the only job you'll ever do. It's allowing these individuals to to develop and and grow as as they are able to do. Um, some some of the challenges that, that we faced, I think, Drew, was I think we probably um, I think we had underestimated how much um, you know what, what capability Shomari actually had, and I think uh, one of the challenges as well was I think people kind of were walking around on eggshells, um, you know, again trying not to say the wrong thing, trying not not to sound derogatory, um, instead of actually rolling the sleeves up um, and actually, you know participating in, in the initiative as well. Um, I think as well, you know, ultimately what is important, and I think um, somebody touched on it earlier, is, you know, Shamori is there to do a job, um, and, and that's what he wants to do. You know, that's what he's been wanting to do um, his whole life. And bearing in mind, he's only 19 years old. So, you know, anybody, any 19-year-old would struggle with, um, with what Shamori is currently doing. And I think what was important there was, 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 was work for it again. Being able to pick up the phone any time, uh, any, any day, phone, phone any from the person from work with and say, listen, we're having this problem, what do you think I should do? Um, this happened today, um, you know, talking to Shamari's parents again, you know, making sure that the support is there all around. Um, what we would have done differently is we would have should have started this years ago, to be completely honest with you. Um, that's, that, that's our biggest, our biggest regret, um, you know, having, having na the naivety and, and the ignorance of not actually knowing um, enough about this, so. Sí, a mí me gustaría añadir. What I would like to add is that some of the examples, we, we wouldn't go back because we're absolutely fascinated with the project on the contrary. But one of the things that I would do is to share some of the lessons um, that we have learned um, not only with the person who comes in, but with the team itself. On the one side, the aid from the from the team, from Aura's, uh, Aura's help, uh, is very important that they're supported when they come in to work. It's a new it's a new environment for them, and where they have to relearn their customs. And it's also the support from the from the people in the boutique that they come to work. It, you, we have to realize that it's a team teamwork, but it's it's a teamwork where they are coming in. Like the Peter mentioned previously, is not um, is not a, a, a yard, a playful yard in the school. Is the the schoolyard is 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 something that has to bring satisfaction. If we have to define it, it has to be something that we are every day gaining and uh, and jumping and 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 surviving. Um, barriers uh, the same way that the person with uh, Down syndrome and this is what generates a very very good energy and uh, collaborated collaborative work 
and teamwork. Um, at least in Spain, um, I very pos we have very positive um, anecdotes, and we wouldn't go back, but but we but it has made us think. I, I, I'm going to speak in Spanish again. I would like to answer Alex to the question that he, uh, that he had before. Hi, Alex. I was uh, quite worried um, the, about the question that he was wondering what his future would be like. I hope he he puts on the uh, head the headpiece, the earpiece. What, what I would like to think is that Alex's future is not going to be to make photocopies or to scan papers in a, in a machine in a small firm. What I would like Alex to be uh, a, a, a legal advisor in the company. And why not? I'll remind you that not long ago in the last century, probably in this room, there wouldn't be a single woman. Women were not allowed to work, not even to were allowed to vote. Why not Alex with Down syndrome in his future? He can, he can end up as a delegate. Uh, he could be an influential figure in the way that he works in the company. He can be a CEO. I suppose that everyone has seen uh, the movie uh, Tom Hanks Big. It's uh, it's that him with a with the child's brain is a is a company, and he drives the company to success. It's a very, very easy to understand how one person with uh, with the mentality of a, of a person with Down syndrome can can achieve so many things. Not only are we responsible as corporations to give them work, but it's to give them qualifying jobs and to help them from a school from a school that people to help people understand that they are. Uh, people who yes are different because we are living in a in a in a different world in a diverse world. So we need to educate the new generations, and as corporations, we need to try to make our social uh, work to work for them to find what is their ca their capacities and give them that job, not only just a job, give them the job. I I feel that I'm being a little rude, but it's it's how how we think in uh, in 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 Casa Carlota. Do, 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 should I leave? Should I? Should I? Um, yeah, thank you, Jose. thank you, Jose. That was really powerful. Um, I guess another thought that I've had while we've been um, talking here this afternoon is, um, you know, there's been a, a number of representatives here from companies who've talked about their their diversity policy and how um, they're very ethically responsible. Um, and I think in this day and age, most companies would probably say the same thing, but we all know that most companies aren't following the same practices of employing people with Down syndrome and developmental disabilities. So I guess my question to the panel is, um, what made it happen in your organization? What is the difference? You know, what was the, the spark that really changed the opportunity for people to acquire these roles within your organizations. And I know for some people who've already spoken, you know, they had a child who had a disability, but is there uh, any reflections on that personally or as a company, what, what made the difference? So, so in our company, uh, two people. It doesn't actually take a lot. It just took two people to really believe that to believe in it and want to do it and 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 to drive it through and and at each point of challenge to say actually no we're saying these things our, our corporation is saying that we believe in this so we should do it um and and it just happened from there frankly um once i think once you uh, someone really takes it to heart and says they want to make it happen then all the barriers start to fall away and of course as we've been saying throughout the day <coughs> Once it actually happens, then so many people see the benefit of it, and there are many. Yeah, 
I was going to jump in there as well. I think a lot of it starts with tone at the top. And I think um, we were quite lucky that our CEO says it um, a lot, that he wants to have a positive effect on society. And I guess for me, sitting on the European management team, if you know you're getting supported by the group board, that they want these things to happen, that it's very, you're pushing an open door. So actually making it, making a start is actually easier than you think. I think you just have to bring it up and say, this is what we want to do, and this is why. And I think there's many partners out there that you can work with. And it's almost like the, it's the fear of failure. What happens if this doesn't work? What happens if that? But actually, just try it. You know, if you're going to fail, fail fast, but at least try it. So, uh, yeah, I would say tone at the top. Um, but I think in most organizations, and certainly with most big organizations, there is a big willingness to make it happen. But you just need somebody to say, I want to do it. And I think you'll find you have an awful lot of support in the bank. Um, all other ways in uh, hello again. Um, I probably believe it's about breaking barriers. And uh, as Monse and Jose Maria said before, we started out with a different project. And at a point, uh, probably eight years ago, someone thought, why don't we give them a chance to be in, in, in our customer int intimacy process, which we value the most? Why not? Let's give it a try. We, we, we had to overcome things and situations and, and learn a lot, but we decided to normalize completely our, our, uh, our project for them. It was not something right for their abilities, and as Jose Maria said, like someone there stuck for so many years doing the very same things, being contempt. We thought, okay, let's give it a challenge. Let's get them step by step to explore what they can reach. So the goal here is to learn how far they can go. And, and as, as you said before, like what, what's the boundary? What's the limit? We don't know yet, but we need to try. And, and as you're saying, Tommy, we, we made lots of mistakes in the process and we failed, but we recovered real, real fast. And, and also the, the will of our, our, our people there, our Down syndrome people and the teams, as, as Monsa stated before, has made it possible. So we are here and we are, uh, 10 years later, we're presenting our hu humbling, we're humbling presenting our project in front of you all, you all guys, because we truly believe in what we're doing uh, for, our, for our Down syndrome people. I would like to uh, mention and to add that one more thing. Uh, we are also a, a glorious victim and uh, the, the foundation, Aura Foundation. A few years ago, I went to her office and I said, I want to start a design studio with uh, a creative people with Down syndrome. I went with my partner and I remember that Gloria told me that I was completely crazy, that I, I, I was not well. But yes, the only thing he said is try, fight, uh, follow it, pursue it, and see if you can uh, reach it and, and, and make it. And five years later, we have over a company with over 15 people uh, in, in Medellin. And may, if, if God, God uh, provides, uh, we'll be in New York. And that's a lesson that I think that when we have people with uh, Down syndrome in corporations, we should try to find out what it is that they know how to do. What are they capable of? How can they help us change the corporation and uh, grow it uh, thanks to them? Uh, I think Carlos uh, told a story that was great. I love the, the story of the of the finger to see if, if the coffee was had or the milk was had. I don't think it's a mistake. I think that's how a person with uh, Down syndrome things. The easiest thing is to put your finger in there and to see if it's hot or, or cold. Why complicate your life? I think he, she was giving you an idea to create an idea to create some sort of device to see if the coffee is hot or cold. Not the mistake, not look at the mistake. I think we should like think about a patent. Do you have any idea how the lady was screaming? I suppose that lady was uh, someone with a terrible bias. Uh, but yeah, she can call me. She can call me and I'll explain it to her.
is it? And um, yeah, I mean, again, the the thing we're hearing again and again is focusing on what people can do. And, and another shout out to Alex there. You know, um, I think you know my words to Alex would be, you know, in our world, in our society today. I don't know what country you're from, but in our society today, for people with disabilities or learning difficulties, there's a lot of focus on what you can't do. You know, and I'm sure if that's your mum there, Alex, she knows all about that because she's probably hearing all about that every day from your school and therapists and different people involved in your life. And I think the focus has to be on what you can do and trying to almost, you know, push those other voices away a little bit and just focusing on, you know, your capacities and your ability and your skills and whatever direction that takes you in. Um, that's that's what you should follow and I think that's what the employers here today have done is they've not tried to fit people into jobs they've tried to fit jobs around people you know and it's coming at it from a different angle to what society wants us to you know to how we put people into boxes you know so um so to wrap up, um, I think we have about five minutes left so maybe just final thoughts from the panel here on um, where they're, where they're taking their work now and any other thoughts that they might have for employers who are also considering the work that we've talked about today. I was just thinking as you, you were speaking there of a little anecdote, if you if you bear <laughs> with me. I remember when I was in my early 20s, so not that long ago, um, and I wanted to go off to South America for uh, a year or so and just couldn't get my head around doing it and it, I couldn't make the decision and in the end I bought the airline <coughs> ticket and you know what everything else just f fell into place as soon as I bought the ticket so often when I'm speaking to firms about whether or not they should embark on this journey I say just buy the ticket <laughs> everything else will fall into place <clears throat> I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think uh, a final thought for us, and uh, I was mentioned this to Tommy a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it, was, we, it was quite a watershed moment for us. Um, when Shamora has actually started to train staff, um, and that, when you actually look back at, it, at that moment, that was absolutely fantastic for us. Um, the second thing is, is, is that the actual... Um, the, the agreement or the, or the, or the combination ha has to be right for the employer and the candidate. If, if, if you have that combination, then it's, it becomes sustainable um, and, and you get a lot of buy-in you know, from the employer and, and specifically fr from the candidates as well. Um, and then I think um, last but not least, as I said, lead, lead, lean on the specialists. Um, we are but no, you know, we're not shy to say we aren't specialists, um, but there are specialists out there. So. And I'd lean on them, and they've been absolutely fantastic for the support. Thanks. Yeah, I guess just to add to that, I think I would say, um, I think buy a ticket is a very good, uh, good analogy to use. Um, but any organization that has, I'd say, over 10, 20 people, you will have plenty roles that people with Down syndrome can carry out very, very effectively. So if you're not employing somebody with Down syndrome, you're probably making excuses why you can't. And to be honest, from the, probably the biggest challenge we had was our internal organization and trying to get through all the policies and procedures that we've set up ourselves. So we actually started the process saying, are we an inclusive, open environment place to work? And myself and Chad looked at each other and said, yes, of course we are. By the end of the process, we realized we completely aren't. Um, so we have to change a lot of things. Um, and that's a journey that you learn on. But there's definitely the opportunity there to hire people. You just have to make it happen. So I think any organization who doesn't do it, it's really just an excuse why you don't do it. But uh, there's definitely roles there for people. And I think people just need to just do it, just get it done. And buy the ticket, I think it's an excellent analogy. A 
Okay, I think we have literally two minutes. So I didn't know if there's anybody in the audience that had a question that they wanted to shoot quickly. Sure. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Hi. Uh, thank you. My name is Fernando Heidrich. I'm from the Meta Social Institute, a NGO in Brazil that also acts here in the US. Mm -hmm. It's been a pleasure to hear you all. Uh, fantastic job. Thanks for that. My question to you is, this case is when you guys have hired people with Down syndrome has been part of a broader diversity strategy of the company or has been just like some of you said, a specific motivation for hiring the talents with Down syndrome? In our case, we did a design study. The fact of hiring people with Down syndrome is because we needed people with Down syndrome to help the rest of the team to see the world uh, in a different way, their way of understanding things, of seeing things. It's extraordinary for a team that has a very different uh, point of view, that diversity. That mix is what makes a creative uh, agency powerful. We did not value so much that they were Down syndrome, but uh, what they could contribute precisely because they had Down syndrome. Question, because, um, yeah, we uh, we do employ Down syndrome people, but it's, it's further bigger diversity. We, we truly believe it's, you need to look at your company's heart, that's what we say, and diversity makes the, the company, uh, the company DNA stronger, because um, uh, it's, it gives you like all that potential from different points of view, from different capabilities, different possibilities, and the outcome, it multiplies the result. It doesn't just add up. And diversity comes from many different sources, not just uh, different abilities. It comes from gender, from intellectual background, from any, any, any uh, source you may think of. And uh, how grateful are these companies that truly consider diversity, it's an asset in their DNAs. So that's my opinion here. One of the things that, um, that that I felt about our diversity and inclusion program a few years ago was that it, it wasn't moving quickly enough. We were saying the right things, but we weren't doing enough of the right things. And, and I think many organizations do things incrementally. <clears throat> what, the, what I work with the Down Syndrome Association has allowed us to do is actually make an enormous step change, an enormous step forward in that broader uh, diversity and inclusion program because what it does is it hugely changes the perspective of your employees very quickly. Um, they start to collaborate more, they really see the benefit um, of, of the program, it, you know, it increases innovation, it builds higher performing teams. It's really powerful and I'm talking about you know, a professional services organization having one or two people with Down syndrome in the office has genuinely made that difference and so you make a step change in your diversity and inclusion program and it allows all the other things that you're trying to achieve happen so much easier. I guess for us, it wasn't, um, originally it wasn't actually included in our diversity program. So uh, Chad raised the vacancy and I signed it off and then we, uh, we got on with it. Um, now it is linked very much with our diversity program, but I guess my message would be, if your organization doesn't have a diversity program, you don't have to wait for that. You just need to have a vacancy and fill it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have one other question and then we'll be finishing. Can you hear me? No? Yeah, okay. Um, just being the mom of a little child with Down syndrome, and I know we're on a great journey. journey. I'm, I'm really nervous. <laughs> um, um, I see there's a huge difference in dealing with the protection of the rights of individuals with Down syndrome at working situations, varying from a lot of hours of work to regular hours. And it looks like a lot of individuals with Down syndrome take pride in routine and in doing their duties. And it's a fine line 
between taking advantage and just giving the right, I don't know how to say it, the right balance. It's just a concern, and I know we will overcome that maybe faster than women rights, history, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it is something I just wanted to put out there. Does this make sense, what I'm saying? No. <laughs> um, how can we avoid taking advantage of individuals with Down syndrome at working, at work, not to overload them with work? Overload them with too much work? Like, give them the right amount, because they might not speak up as we do. Sure. I don't know. Do you, do you want me to take that one? Yeah, I think um, it's like any employee. It's about listening to your employees and actually working with partners. So, for example, in the initial few weeks, we came across numerous situations, and actually we were doing it the wrong way. We actually weren't pushing Shamari hard enough. And, you know, so, so for example, trying to find a balance it can be quite difficult, but that's why working with professional partners like WorkFit really helped us work out where that balance is. And it just takes a bit of time. And one a day, um, uh, so I'm a dad with a, um, a five-year-old son, Dara, with Down syndrome. And one of, the, one of the things is, you know, the things I want for him is also to be in employment. You know, so one, one of the big things we found is if you include the family. You know, so when you're talking to your um, prospective candidate, also bring the family along, talk to them. You know, because they'll be able to help you uh, understand how to get the best from your employee. And that's what we should be doing with every employee we have. How can we get the best from that individual? So I would say um, it helps us to listen to employees and just um, uh, an employee with Down syndrome is no different to any other employee and just listen to their concerns and try to get the most out of them um, that we can. Thank you, Tommy. Um, so we're going to wrap up there. Um, I just want to thank the panelists here for, um, okay, we've got another question. <laughs> oh, yeah, one more. <laughs> Go for it. Yes, my name's Selena. I'm from Bermuda. Um, my reason for attending this today was to uh, take back home ideas. So I just want to know, um, where can I start in getting to the employee employers um, in hiring people with Down syndrome? Because here I brought Soleil Thomas with me, and she is eager to work in the community. So I just want, from anyone, where can we start um, in driving this initiative for people with Down syndrome to be able to work and be paid and be inclusive? Well, I think uh, Fred I probably answered this really well. Um, and I know, you know, a big part of this is about discovery and really figuring out what, who people are and what they can bring to the workplace. But is really understanding, oh, am I not on? Okay, now I'm on. Uh, the person you're representing and what she can bring to the workplace, as Ben says, her skills, her talents, the condition she needs to be successful. And then on the other hand, I'd use every personal contact you have to meet every potential employer. And I'd go in, and I think someone on the previous panel, I can't quite remember who, said start to think about what that business needs, what that employer needs, and see where you can make the match. Thank you. So um, great question as well. Um, so we're going to wrap up now. I just want to thank the panelists. Uh, really insightful and thoughtful um, responses today, and I think we've got a lot to think on. Um, you know, especially uh, I think Peter's comment really resonates with me. The you know just buying the ticket, I think, is um, great advice. But um, so we'll wrap up now, and I will pass back over to Andrew. Thank you.
Okay, so um, on the assumption that uh, none of you are yet bored with the sound of my voice, um, which you may be, um, this is the uh, final panel for today. Um, so closing remarks, and um, what we're going to do uh, briefly is consider the key messages from, from this conference and then look at how individuals, organizations, employers, and other stakeholders can deliver and promote these messages globally. The power of media communication in sharing the benefits employment makes to the lives of people with Down syndrome and how their contributions make a real positive difference for their colleagues, employers, and the community. So I have two um, panelists with me. So I have Beth Haller from the Global Alliance for Disability in Media and Entertainment from the United States, and uh, then there is myself. I will say a few brief words. So as you know, Executive Director of Down Syndrome International. And then um, after the closing remarks, we will have an introduction to the Inside Out exhibition uh, from Jade Matarazzo. Um, so um, without further ado, I would like to hand over to Beth. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I gave out a few of these cards. I just want to promote this organization. A few of you probably know Patricia Almeida, who is from Brazil. And um, she and I and another advocate from um, Australia, um, Katia Panetta, um, founded this organization because we want there to be a lot more kind of give and take for um, organizations around the world about promoting media as a way to kind of educate the world about um, issues related to people with disabilities and people with Down syndrome. So I'm just have a really brief presentation, um, kind of with the thought of how we can influence public opinion, basically, and get our communities to know about employment opportunities, um, know about the benefits of employing people with Down syndrome, and I'm biased in the image that I first have here. Um, this is a guy in Fort Worth, Texas, which happens to be my hometown. And let me see if I can advance it to the story. So the Fort Worth Star-Telegram did this story about Austin Underwood, who founded his own food truck. And um, he also works in a restaurant in Fort Worth. After finding his passion of working in the food industry, he wanted to train to be a chef. So he was in a vocational program in New Mexico, and um, then he moved back to Fort Worth and could only get jobs um, not as a chef but as a um, host and um, working very happily as a greeter in a host Italian restaurant. Um, but then the kind of community came together to support him and his dream, and so he started this food truck to um, do catering on the side. He's still keeping his job at the Italian restaurant. So I think it's a really good example of, you know, here's just a regular old newspaper in a medium-sized city in the United States kind of telling the world about Austin's dream and then the community now knows about his food truck, that they can hire it for catering jobs. They know that if they go to this Italian restaurant in West Fort Worth that they can meet Austin and um, you know, that that's a restaurant that supports hiring people with Down syndrome. So I feel like that, you know, that kind of 
story um, moves the conversation forward and then somebody that reads that story, because everything can be read online now, um, will think, oh, maybe my son, maybe my daughter is interested in going into um, that kind of work. Or it just gives people ideas about things they can potentially do um, for employment. So the Mighty did a story about businesses owned by people with Down syndrome. So I think, again, it's another way that it's highlighting for the world um, you know, businesses that people with Down syndrome are running. And these are usually not self-sustaining businesses that people are only employed with their own business, but you know, they're a sideline business, that kind of thing. Again, I think it helps to um, give people ideas. And then I'm sure a lot of you know Noah's dad's blog. So he just did a really nice informational post about 36 companies that have a good record of employing people with intellectual disabilities. Very short, kind of just a list. Um, but, you know, now people can go to Kroger, HEB, Publix, Target, Acme, and say, look, I have this list. Um, maybe they're not employing people with Down syndrome in that community, but they can little put a little pressure saying that you've now made the list, so you need to be employing people in our community with Down syndrome. I know. <laughs> it is too heavy of a touch. And this is media coverage of Alexis Kane, um, who opened her Ladybugs Boutique in Murray, Kentucky. Um, this one is kind of interesting because she is the first person with Down syndrome to join a sorority, and she went to a college there in Murray, Kentucky. Um, and it's obvious from this picture that she's getting a lot of support from the friendships she made in college and um, the, her sorority sisters helping her out um, and promoting her um, business. So, you know, I think that kind of community-based um, business is also, you know, again, people see this in one little town in Kentucky, and then they think maybe we can start this in our town too. And then this one was shared all over Facebook, this interview, jeez. <laughs> This interview with Colette, I don't know if she made it uh, from the snow this morning. Yeah. She was here? Good. Um, and this was done um, back on February 25th, and I saw it shared again yesterday. So and that's another, I think, point that I'd like to make about social media especially is that, you know, this kind of coverage is shared over and over, and then people will be sharing it next year and the next year. And that kind of um, way that, people get information through, you know, all the social media outlets these days, give other people ideas about um, hiring people with um, Down syndrome for their bakery, for their business. So I think it all kind of influences public opinion. And then this article I really want to focus on, and I highly recommend going and looking at it, um, because I learned something about one of my colleagues from this article. So it has a um, couple of paragraphs quoting a computer science professor at Towson University, which is where I work in Maryland. And he has done research on how people with Down syndrome use technology. And he says he wants to take people out of the food, flowers, and filth business because he feels like too many people with Down syndrome are only given landscaping jobs, food service jobs, or um, janitorial jobs. And his research actually shows that a lot of people with Down syndrome have better skills at technology than neurotypical people. And so he's encouraging employers to understand this. And like I said, until I read this article, I didn't know he was quoted in the article. I was just looking for information about employing people with Down syndrome. And, um, you know, I found out about his research. And that kind of research is something that I think could be taken to employers. Um, he has very specific research he did that found that people with Down syndrome could interpret the CAPTCHA images, you know, those little 
um, goofy images that you have to fill out when you're um, buying tickets faster than neurotypical people. They could perceive the CAPTCHA um, quicker. So um, he feels like there's a lot of um, tech jobs that should be employing people with Down syndrome. And again, this is a media story that is giving us all information that we need to um, take to employers about why they should be hiring people with Down syndrome. And I found out something about one of my coworkers. <laughs> And finally, um, so why is this important? It highlights people with Down syndrome who, have, who are employed, and that can lead to other employers being more open to hiring, I believe. Um, you know, it's a competitive world in the business world. So I think seeing positive representations of people hiring people with Down syndrome encourages others to hire. Um, it gives people with Down syndrome and their allies ideas about starting their own businesses or services. It educates the general public about the need for greater employment opportunities for people with Down syndrome. So I think it's all good. I mean, sometimes there's not great media coverage, but I think the more we get the message out there, the more employers will want. And also, they like positive public relations, right? They want this um, media coverage, and I think it will benefit them as well. So if you have any questions or want to email me, here's how you can find me. And um, do not hesitate to contact me. I know we all have a long day of snow. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. I'll just turn your mic off there. Um, it was a very interesting presentation, and you know, I think that you know, there, we need to look at a lot of ways to get this message out there. Um, and channeling the media um, in the ways that you suggest is, is, you know, it's a way to a potentially to a big to a big win for a, a large amount of the population. So um, that's um, very interesting. Um, I just like to deliver some some closing remarks that probably look more. They look at the sort of the, the dissemination of the message, but also about the message itself and about who needs to be delivering that and um, making sure that they are they are enabled to deliver it. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say, you know, that this, this conference, um, I, you know, we're incredibly happy that it went ahead today. You know, there is, um, you know, we have a UN Security Council meeting, we have some tourists, but apart from that, the UN is, is Down syndrome heavy today, which, you know, is no bad thing as far as I'm concerned. Uh, all the staff have gone home, so, <laughs> so, but we made it through, so that's fantastic. And specifically this conference today, or the concept of people with Down syndrome and employment is, is fascinating to me. People like me, at what I would say at the coalface of the Down syndrome advocacy community, we live and breathe advocating for people with Down syndrome and disabilities. And we do this for two reasons. Number one, because they have human rights. We are at the international home of human rights. The UN in Geneva might argue with that, but certainly one of the international homes of human rights. And people with Down syndrome have the right to work along with other people. The second reason, as we have heard so much about today, is that it makes sense. People with Down syndrome can and do bring so much to the community, whether it's in education, in work, in recreation, in the arts, in sport, in social cohesion, when they are given the opportunity. But of course, as we have heard from so many people today, they bring so much specifically to the workplace. Time and again, we hear reports of how people with Down syndrome who go into a company, small or large, technical or vocational, have the capacity not just to do the job they are employed to do well, with loyalty, with real gusto, if they are matched with unique skills that they possess, but also to transform the entire outlook of the organization, improving culture, morale, and by extension, 
improving productivity. But then I look at where we are today outside of this room and my concern is that not by a long shot are there enough people with Down syndrome in work. Tommy Flynn, you know, um, today gave us the statistic, you know, it's a, it's a really, really low amount of people, you know, with Down syndrome who are in, who are in employment. So why is that? For me, the reason is simple, that not enough is being done to spread the word. So this, this is our challenge. And of course, media, networking, peer-to-peer, -peer, business to business discussions, case studies, are all effective means to, to spread that word. But the onus is on us. And by us, I mean all of the key stakeholders. People with Down syndrome, of course, will advocate for their own opportunities, but they need to be supported. They need to be supported by family members, by friends, by employment NGOs, and by employers. The key thing for me, though, is really is that we all need to, in inverted commas, get it. We all need to understand that this is not about charity. It's not about giving people with Down syndrome something to do. It's not even about solving a problem by getting them into, say, one job for the rest of their lives. It's about everyone understanding the added value of employing people with Down syndrome and disabilities. People with Down syndrome need to know this. They need to know this for their confidence and their self-esteem they need to know that they add value. Families need to know this. They need to know this so that they can support people with Down syndrome in the right way, and that's crucial. Employment NGOs need to know this so that they can get people with Down syndrome hired. And employers need to know this so that they can hire them and become, like us, the converted. And that's it, it's that simple. Um, there's a lot of work to do, but as far as I'm concerned, that, that's what needs to be done. And I hope that, you know, I'm, I, I absolutely know that everybody in this room and watching at home understands that. And we need to make sure that everybody else out there understands that too. So to, to finish, um, I would just like to say thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you to speakers and to delegates alike, to those of you watching online now or in the future. I would also like to say a huge thank you to our sponsors, uh, without whom we would not be able to use this incredible auditorium and facilities and for all the efforts that they have made to get us all here today. And finally, to the conference team, to, to Helen, to Jessamy, to Bridget, to John and the DSI guys back home, who um, most of whom now need a drink, a drink and a long sleep. Now, on the subject of a drink and something to keep you busy this evening, I would uh, like to introduce uh, Jade Matarazzo, who will provide us with an introduction to the Inside Out exhibition. Over to you, Jade. Well, first of all, I'd like to Thank everybody that made this possible to be here. It's really important for all of us to have a voice. Um, I don't know if you have, do you have the presentation? Oh, okay, <laughs> that will help. So um, we have come together uh, to put this exhibition, um, it's called Inside Out. If you guys uh, really could come tonight, um, the postcards and our banner is back there with uh, address and, um, and uh, time is 6.30. Uh, also, what is this about? This is about breaking the aesthetics and conceptual standards and it's a reflection of the many faces of any woman and not just a woman with Down syndrome. Inside Out aims to change it to create new paradigms, and it, wa it wants to be another 
inclusion revolution through the arts. It includes the model by employing her, and she's here today, Tachi Piancastelli. <laughs> Um, and uh, we put together a group of artists that are also here today, and each one of them has interpreted the many facets of um, Tachi, representing the many facets of all the women with Down syndrome. Um, I know Fernando is telling me to change the slide there. <laughs> But it's, okay, here are the artists, and they are going to be here. Yes, I'm pressing too hard. <laughs> so I really, I really didn't want to mess this up. But uh, I think that this is, I'm, I think I'm going to just say um, without it, because I'm not being very good at it. But so... Um, we really wanted to show through the art the different possibilities of the, the Tachi's uh, many facets. So I would like for her to talk about who she is and also we have a little surprise for you guys afterwards. So, aqui você lê eu vou traduzir. Tá. Eu sou Tati Pia Castelli, moro em Miami, eu tenho 33 anos. I am Tati Pia Castelli. I am Tati Pia Castelli, I live in Miami, and I'm 33 years old. Sou atriz, escritora, blogueira, bastante modelo, apresentadora, influente digital, e eu sou independente. I'm an actress, a writer, a speaker, a model, youtuber, a digital influencer, and I am independent. Essa exposição representa como eu me vejo como mulher. And this exhibition represents to me how I see myself as a woman. Uh, I really would like for you guys to be there tonight. Um, it's very, very interesting, and I think it's a different side of what we're used to seeing. Um, and I want to call... Um, Manu Militão, Jonatas Chimain, and the photographer that created the images. Uh, she is the mother of Alici, who also has Down syndrome. And there they are. I would like to thank them. And I think that this is worth a million words. <laughs> And this is the future. Yeah. So I think we're all here for that. We have um, an image that is called The Dream of Alice. And it is Tatiana and Alice together. Um, and I think that in the heart of Nila, Alice is everything and more that Tatiana is today, and that's what she wishes for her daughter. It was her first contact with an adult with Down syndrome, and it has changed her life. Won't you guys come here? Mm -hmm. um, just to end real quick, um, Manu Militão, this guy here, he painted Tachi with wings and um, it represents that the Down syndrome children and adults, they don't want to be angels, they want to be treated like everybody else. And um, Jonathan Schumann, he's an academic, 
a painter, and he painted. He painted. He painted a six-foot-tall image of Tachi as a queen, symbolically as a queen, um, where she rules her own life. And that's Jonathan's. Thank you very much. This is the crew. I hope you guys can come tonight. Yeah. Sorry, I messed up. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Thank no. You very much. I've just uh, I've made a note actually that we need to um, end every single World Dance and a Day conference with an incredibly cute baby. So <laughs> that's what we'll be doing from from now on. Thank you, Jade, and thank You're you, welcome. thank you very much, guys. It looks fantastic. Um, I'll certainly be there, and I very much encourage everybody else too. So we will have thank you. wine. And <laughs> yes, yeah, that's nice Brazilian I know. <laughs> things tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Caipirinha, yeah. Um, okay, so just um, thank you very much, everybody. Just one more administration announcement. So I know that the uh, the hardworking guys at UN Security um, would, um, if possible, they would like us to clear this this chamber as quickly as we can. Now, obviously, if you'd like to meet up with people, continue conversations. There's a an area outside and then there's a long walk down to the main entrance so feel free to to work your way slowly out of the UN building but reasonably quickly out of this building thank you very much everybody